welcome friends good morning and good afternoon and good evening to our viewers chairs and speakers in asia and rest of the world we are back again with this week's second educational webinar for you the speaker for the first session of today is a giant in cerebrovascular surgery professor fadi sharbel from illinois usa professor sharbel is the professor and head of department of neurosurgery at the ui health Dr. Charbel has received the Dr. Richard L. and Gertrude W. Fruin Professorship in 2014. He is an internationally recognized clinical expert, researcher, and educator in the areas of stroke, cerebrovascular diseases like AVMs and brain aneurysm, cerebral blood flow metabolism, and complex cerebral tumors. Active in the development of new technology, Dr. Charbel's work has led to the innovation in medical devices as well as surgical simulators. He is the developer and co-inventor of the Charbel Microflow Probe Transonic Systems and of the Nova System. systems dr sharbel received the wall street journal technology innovation award medical devices runner up in 2006 and inventor of the year the university of illinois at chicago in 2002 he has been named one of america's top surgeons consumers research council of america best Do doctors of best doctors in america and top doctor at the castle connolly medical limited dr sharbel has been invited worldwide to lecture teach and demonstrate complex surgical procedures He currently holds eight patents and has produced over 200 scientific presentations and over 150 publications. We are extremely thankful to Professor Sharbel for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars today. He is going to share his personal experience about the evolution of surgical treatment of myomyelitis disease. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from China, Professor Yabo Huang. Professor Huang is currently working in Department of Neurosurgery, the first affiliated hospital of Suzhou University, China. He is mainly engaged in clinical and basic research of cerebrovascular diseases. He specializes in the techniques about intracranial to extracranial bypass. He has performed nearly 2,000 cases of such complex procedures in his illustrious career. We are extremely thankful to Professor Huang for accepting our invitation to speak to us at our webinars. Today he is going to talk about his surgical strategies for unclippable middle cerebral artery aneurysms. The chair for the first session of today is Professor Miki Fujimura from Japan. Professor Fujimura is the professor and chairman of Department of Neurosurgery, Hokkaido University School of Medicine, Sapporo, Japan. His surgical interests include microsurgery for cerebrovascular diseases, mainly myomyelitis disease, aneurysm surgery, and molecular biology of cerebral ischemia and cerebral blood flow and metabolism. He is a noted author who has published several articles and he is also on the editorial board of the Journal of Cerebrovascular Diseases. We are extremely fortunate and thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is Professor Hidenori Endo from Japan. Professor Endo is the director and chief neurosurgeon of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Konan Hospital, which is the main stroke center of Tohoku University in Sendai, Japan. He was involved in the basic research of cerebral ischemia at Stanford University in California from 2004 to 2006. He is currently involved in the clinical practice of cerebrovascular diseases, mainly treated by open surgery, namely clipping, bypass, and AVMs. We are extremely fortunate and thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. A warm welcome to Professor Shubin from Shanghai, who is a leading expert in myomyelitis disease as well. And we are extremely grateful to him for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel in China. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to Professor Fujimura. Hello, everybody. So it is my particular pleasure to invite uh, Professor Fadi Shaver, uh, who is a professor and chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, University of Illinois, Chicago. So I have shared a lot of opportunity with Professor Shaver in the International Moya Moya Conference in the multiple time during the past fifteen years. So today, Professor Shaver is talk about. To, Uh, talking about the evolution of revascularization strategies for Moya Moya disease, personal experience. So, Professor Shabell, would you start your lecture? Thank you so much. Good morning and afternoon and evening, everybody. I know we're in multiple time zones, and it's uh, wonderful to be with you. I'm about to share my screen right now. So, it is it is my great pleasure, truly my great pleasure, to be here with you. Uh, Uh, today to share this uh, uh, this uh, story about how I evolved in my thinking about uh, revascularization of Moya Moya disease. We have an amazing group of uh, of panelists, moderators, chairs here, and uh, it's a real pleasure to share this and interact with you in this conversation. I will start by acknowledging, of course, Professor Kato, 
Yoko Kato, a giant of neurosurgery and whose uh, uh, print on the education has been worldwide, an amazing neurosurgeon, an amazing lady. And uh, we all owe her a debt to gratitude for all the efforts, the pioneering efforts she's done in Japan and around the world in advancing neurosurgery, as well as the education of neurosurgery. So thank you, Yoko, and uh, congratulations on continuing with this effort and as president of the ACNS. Uh, of course, I would like to also acknowledge uh, the chairs of this session, uh, starting with, uh, uh, with Professor Fujimura. Truly, congratulations, a great honor to be uh, uh, at this point uh, taking the, the helm of the Hokkaido prestigious university, Department of Neurosurgery, well-deserved. Uh, uh, they couldn't be a better person to do this. And of course, uh, Professor Endo, uh, with the fine tradition of, uh, of Sendai, with so much pioneering work uh, in my relationship with Sendai, as well as with Hokkaido, goes back many, many, many years. And uh, we've always enjoyed uh, comparing notes and, uh, and, uh, and uh, recalling stories uh, about Sendai and other things. Uh, Dr. Kuri, you've done a fantastic job. You've been a very gracious uh, uh, interlocutor, inviting me, keeping everything on track with your co-chair, Professor Seng. So thank you. I know the hard work is done by you, uh, the young people, and uh, we owe you a debt to gratitude, and I'm sure everyone who is benefiting from these seminars uh, recognizes that. Uh, and I'm delighted, uh, really, to, to, to note that Professor Shubin is here, uh, and I'm looking forward to my co-speaker co a little bit later's lecture. Professor Shubin, all of you know, is, <laughs> is the jewel giant of neurosurgery. Uh, but it, it, there's something even more special about Professor Shubin. He, he, he is absolutely one of the hardest working, most skilled surgeons I know, uh, and at the same time, extremely approachable, always eager to teach, share his experience. Uh, uh, if, you, if you didn't know that he has such an amazing experience and, and he does so many bypasses and so much work, you wouldn't know it from speaking to him. Uh, modest person, but uh, very deserving. So it's truly an honor to be with all of you. I feel that we're among friends and uh, we share the same values and uh, look forward to, uh, uh, since we can't see each other, the vivo to share this platform. So I thought, uh, <clears throat> I thought I'd give you a little bit of tour of where we are. Uh, some of you have visited. Uh, hopefully, all of you will at one day. You're welcome to come to Chicago and see us. So on this screen, where you see here is the campus of our university, University of Illinois at Chicago. So it's a large campus. It really goes from the bottom of the screen almost two thirds of the way up to the screen, not quite to the lake, but to where the green ends over there. So it's a very large campus and it's a nice uh, university in a sense that it has all the, all the sciences. So it has the medical sciences, all the medical sciences, but it's also very strong in engineering. And, and, and many of you know that I've worked with engineering for over the years and that has been a big reason why I'm at this university wonderful collaboration. It's a very large medical school. It has been the largest in the United States for a number of years. Now it could be some years the largest, some years maybe the second, third largest, but still a very large medical school when it comes to United States. And where you see a star here <clears throat> is the Neuropsychiatric Institute. This is our, our institute here where the star is. And this institute is a building that uh, was put together uh, at the <clears throat> at the uh, beginning of the well mid mid last century. So it was started in 1938 and was completed in 1941. What is interesting about this building, it, it was built to look like the brain. So you see two towers, North and South Tower, which are the hemispheres and they're connected by the corpus callosum. So it was really built in the style of the architecture of Art Deco to represent the brain and all the neurosciences there. So it's a, it's a pioneering concept uh, at the time and remains so today. 
the um, really the champion of the institute was uh, uh, Professor uh, Eric Oldberg. Very interesting man. Eric Oldberg was the last resident of Harvey Cushing. And uh, <clears throat> that's him with Oldberg and Cushing in 1928. Cushing is the one with the big lamp on his head uh, performing brain surgery. And then Oldberg came to Chicago in 31 and uh, was engaged in building uh, the Neuropsychiatric Institute. And eventually uh, <clears throat> he retired uh, in 71. So he had a long tenure of 30 years or so. And he was succeeded by Oscar Sugar, a very fine surgeon. Uh, he's the first to have separated craniopagus twins joined at the vertex. Uh, he was able to save one and uh, not, could not save both of them because they shared the sagittal and other sinuses. Uh, but that was a pioneering surgery in 1957, if you can imagine. He was then succeeded by, uh, by uh, uh, Robert Kroll, who came from, uh, from, from the East Coast. Uh, and then uh, when Dr. Kroll left, eventually Dr. Ausman, James Ausman was recruited, my mentor, I was a resident with him in Detroit, many of you know him, and uh, a big giant of international vascular neurosurgery. And I came with him, and when he retired in 2001, uh, I took over as the head of the uh, of the department, and I've been there, of course, and I'm still there. So uh, this is what it looks like now. Uh, the picture is in color. There's more buildings because the campus keeps growing, the cancer center, the clinic, and so forth. So it keeps growing, and we have additional uh, efforts. But what I'm really excited about, and I look forward for you all to be invited uh, it'd be my pleasure to invite you to come and share with us in this new fantastic space, which is the entire footprint of this building. So what we did, we just opened it about uh, six months ago or so, uh, is the Surgical Innovation and Training Lab. It's a very, very large training space, which is the, the floor of this building. And in that space, we have uh, an amazing facility for the future of innovation and training. And you can see the pedigree. So we wanted the space to bring together the surgical sciences, starting with Cushing and Halstead and come to the present day and all join here in training and innovation of the future. Uh, it's a beautiful space. In the center are the uh, multiple stations where you can have microsurgery and training. And at the same time, the microscopes are actually better than this. They're the real microscopes. But what's here, you can have each, in front of each station are the TV screens where one can see at the same time anatomical lessons and feed direct feed from the OR. So the student can have the cadaver, they can see the steps that they need to perform and they can watch the surgery all at the same time while they're uh, practicing to do it in the lab. We also have two large full operating rooms uh, with everything in there, bigger than even the operating room we have in, in the OR. The uh, space you can see here can be partitioned uh, with this glass that a flip of a switch can become opaque or the color can reopen. So you can have different spaces uh, here is, uh, you see the lighting is different. We can change the lighting, depends on the type of technology we're using, whether endoscopy or microsurgery, different lights are better, whether green or red or blue. Uh, it's a natural space. Uh, what you see here is actual uh, plant. These are living plants, living wall. And here's some of our residents with some of the courses we have. So now we have, a, for our residents, part of their training, uh, we hold one course a month, sometimes two. Uh, and it's a curriculum where we progressively go over all the approaches and so forth, and it's been very well received. Here is the happy faces of the residents. We all know that we love operating, and uh, that's a good way to learn, uh, to learn surgery before we graduate to the patients. So this is John Hunter. You're all very familiar with Hunter, the Hunterian lab, Hunterian ligation. John Hunter was a remarkable man in the 18th century. 
uh, he uh, was a true surgeon scientist. So John Hunter uh, was one of the very, very early pioneers of the surgical scientific method. He uh, was very keen on documenting what he did, at looking for evidence of what he did, and uh, truly pioneered that in so many ways. So John Hunter made the observation that blood goes where it is needed. And he wrote that uh, in his book. And that's a very interesting observation. Uh, and would like to then maybe go over in this talk and try to see how does that apply to when we do bypass surgery. So these are the points that we'll go over. Why do we do a bypass? What is the driver of flow in vivo? Notice that I'm saying in vivo, which is important. Uh, it's not in the lab. And how do we measure flow? What is the cut flow? What is the cut flow index? How do we choose a conduit, which is uh, interesting in aneurysms and in Moya Moya in particular? And why do bypass fail? What can we learn from that? Uh, so why do we do a bypass? Well, I think it's important to remind ourselves that when we do a bypass, we're doing it for one of two reasons. In the context of ischemia, we want to augment flow. So that's flow augmentation bypass. In the context of an aneurysm, we don't augment flow. We are replacing a deficit that we create at surgery because we want to treat this aneurysm and we cannot preserve a vessel. So one is flow replacement or flow preservation, and the ischemia is flow augmentation bypass. So it's important, it's very important. So how do we measure flow quantitatively? And there's two ways to measure flow quantitatively in the blood vessels. One is to use uh, the flow probe, the ultrasonic flow probe, which gives actual flow, not velocity. So this is not Doppler. Doppler, of course, measures velocity. This is transit time ultrasound, and it measures flow quantitatively. And the importance of that is you can do it repeatedly, and it's independent of contact with the vessel. Uh, the other way to measure flow in blood vessel, which can be done outside of the operating room or in the operating room, some places have that in the operating room, is through MRI. And this is the quantitative face contrast MRI technology, NOVA, which uses a software to extract volumetric flood, uh, blood flow from blood vessels. So that's very useful because we can do it in vivo and we can do it without having invasive access to the blood vessel. And we use both. Uh, I'm often asked, how do we evaluate patients that need flow augmentation bypass for ischemia? And the way we do it over the years has progressed to the point where now it's all done uh, with MRI. So after we determine the anatomy and the problem with angiogram, uh, the rest of the physiological workup is MRI based. And we use those three things the first one is the NOVA, quantitative MR angiography with the face contrast that I mentioned to you. That gives us a very nice pictures of the vessel, but especially in large vessel disease, it gives us a very good idea of the flow and of the collaterals. So if you look at this uh, map on the right side, you can see that both internal carotids are occluded. And where we measure flow, you can see in red, you can see that the vertebral artery flows are going up. The arrow indicates the direction of the flow. This bold lettering here, RVA, LVA, basilar artery is the name of the vessel. In black is the flow at rest, and in blue is the flow after a diamox challenge. So we can do a baseline flow, and we can look for reactivity, which you know should be present. So it's everything looks okay. The posterior communicating artery is providing flow to the anterior circulation somewhat, not completely. There's other collaterals from the PCAs bilaterally. You can see that the PCA flow is 184 on the right, 109 on the left. This is high, which is good for this patient. Uh, normally the PCA is about 60, so that's good collateral. So you can see that the collateral is coming from the PCOM a little bit and from peel collaterals from the PCA. But the flows in the middle cerebral artery, the rest of the vessel supratentorially are low. So a normal MCA flow is about 120, it's 80 here. 
But on the left side, there's still a reserve. Whereas on the right side, you can see that there is steel actually in the ACA, in the right middle cerebral artery, there's a very, very little reserve and the flow is very low on the right, 20. So this is one way we look at the flow quantitatively with face contrast MR angiography. And then we go on and we look at the flow with the bold uh, MRI sequence. So in this patient, this is another patient that has a stenosis severe of the right ICA with no A1. And you can see that the global reserve after a CO2 challenge is severely compromised. There's a lot of blue here in the right MCA territory. And then in the same patient, we can do regional reserve. This is a different paradigms. In this case, it's a motor paradigm. And we do it twice because sometimes there is, uh, it's not exactly the same. So to increase reliability, we do it twice. But you can see on both, on both testing, on both repeated paradigm, there is reduced activation in the right MCA territory indicating hemodynamic reserve compromise in the primary motor area. So when we do all those three things together and they all are concordant, this would be a patient that we believe then are, is convincingly compromised flow-wise and we would look at flow augmentation. So when we go ahead and do a bypass, uh, what drives the flow in this bypass in vivo? What is the most important determinant of flow in vivo? And to that, we turn to the Poiseuille equation, which we all know very well, and we've been taught in physiology. And the Poiseuille equation, it appears that the flow is mainly driven by the radius of the vessel because it's to the power of four. While that is true in the laboratory, it is not that important in vivo. That's why the question is, what is the most important determinant of flow in vivo? In vivo, the most important determinant of flow is the pressure gradient, is delta P. That is what's gonna drive the flow from point A to point B. And we'll talk more about that. But what is the cut flow? The cut flow is a very useful measure when we do STA bypass, because it allows us to get a good idea of how much this STA can provide. And people uh, uh, talk sometimes about high flow, low flow, and think that STA can be low flow or, or not. STA flow is determined by measuring it. And when you measure the cut flow, you can find that the STA can be low flow, middle flow, or high flow. Depends on, on, on that STA, of course. But it can be measured, and that's called the cut flow. And once the cut flow is done, it can be very useful at the beginning of the surgery even. So you see this patient we're operating on for Moya Moya, and once we get to the point where we are measuring uh, uh, the cut flow on this patient, it was found to be very low, 9 to 11. And that was uh, a little bit surprising on a vessel that looked healthy and of the size. So this is a relatively large vessel, healthy. So why is it low? The important thing is we found out that it's low. And then we looked and there was a vein that was coagulated crossing the STA proximally. Once we cut this vein that was constricting the STA, the cut flow became 50, so increased by 10 times. So it's the same vessel, but when the resistance increased, it could not flow. Now, if we had not detected that, by the time we get to anastomosing this vessel, probably blood clot would have formed and it would not have been a good thing. It would have lost, lost this vessel. So it's always important to check the gut flow for many reasons. This is one of them. And then you can do the cut flow index. What is the index? It's simply after you finish the bypass, you measure the flow of the bypass and you compare the flow in the bypass to the cut flow. And if the flow in the bypass, let's say is 100 and the cut flow was 100, that's 100% bypass. If it's 50, it's 50%. 20, 20%, and so forth. It gives you an idea about how much of the bypass of the STA this brain is using or the anastomosis is providing. And that is important because what we found over the years, we published that twice 
now, the most recent is for 300 patients, is that the cut flow index is significantly higher with patent bypasses. The bypasses patency rate was 80%, 83% when the cut flow index is more than 0.5, and it was only 46% when the index is less than 0.5. And that was very significant. And very importantly also, when you have a low cut flow index, there was an early versus late bypass non-patency. And we found that out, that the cut flow index is a very strong predictor of long-term bypass patency, especially for flow augmentation bypass. You can see the difference right here. So for Moya Moya and flow augmentation, it's a very important index. So why do bypasses fail? Uh, we classified this into two main reasons, type one and type two. The type one is poor indication. In other words, there is no delta P. There is no need for the bypass. This is very common in bypass for aneurysms, in flow replacement bypass, because as we discussed, the flow replacement bypass for aneurysm is only needed, will only work if there is a deficit. And the purpose of this bypass is to replace the deficit only. So we calculate the deficit. And then that bypass is to replace the deficit. So this is a bypass being done for a giant carotid aneurysm. And I wanted to show you here what happens. So here I plan to replace a carotid with a so-called vein graft. Look how large this vein graft, it's eight millimeter. So some people would say this should be high flow. Well, at this point, we don't know. All we can say is that this is a large conduit bypass. It's eight millimeter and it's a very large vessel. So I will walk you through this. The anastomosis is being done, as you can see here. We're closing one side of the vessel. We're gonna flip it. We're gonna do the other side of the vessel. And that is fine. And once this is finished, and the carotid is anastomosed to the vein, which goes to the M2, we measure flow. And it's only 24 cc's. So large vessel, but very low flow. And look, the flow even stops with every heartbeat. Why? There's no demand yet. The carotid is still open. So I put a clip to partially occlude the carotid and the flow increases. So we've increased the demand. We've increased the delta P. And once we completely occlude the carotid, there's even more demand. And we trap the aneurysm. And now the flow increase even more to 84 cc's. So now the flow is almost four times what it was. And once the aneurysm is completely trapped, and you can see the angiogram, and that's the aneurysm that has been previously coiled and failed, kept growing, the flow in this graft is 161 cc's. So you can see that the same vessel in vivo, the flow went from 24 cc's to 160 cc's. So the driver of flow in vivo is not the diameter. It is the demand, and if there's no demand, that's a type one problem and uh, very common in bypass for aneurysm. So unless you create a demand, the bypass will not necessarily flow. For ischemia, we don't see that, but I will show you this example. This is an old case where we see it in ischemia, and this is because we did not have the tools to study the patient properly. So this is a patient that had a a, a vert lateral vertebral occlusion, and we thought he needed a bypass to the posterior fossa. So the plan is to do an STA in red to superior cerebellar artery bypass in blue. So the flows here are measured continuously in the STA, which is red, and in the SCA in blue. So you can see that the SCA, the STA, superficial temporal artery in red flow, in the beginning, is still in the scalp. And in the scalp, there's very high resistance and the flow is very low. And when we cut it, that's the cut flow. And you can see that same vessel flow went from about three, four cc's to about 64 cc's. So it increased about 15 times. You see the difference? This is because the delta P increased dramatically. And then we occlude it and we do the bypass. But what we found here Remember the bypass for ischemia is flow augmentation. There was no flow augmentation. 
the flow in the superior cerebellar before and after the bypass did not change at all. And the index, here's the STA flow after the bypass, is only about 13 cc's, so it's a very poor index. So this is a type one problem, which is a cause of acute failure. As you can see here, the bypass is not working because the bypass is not needed. So we don't see that anymore. Hopefully we don't see that anymore in bypass for flow augmentation because we have tools to measure flow beforehand and to determine whether the patient needs it. But we see it still in ischemia for flow augmentation over time because you can see now we can measure flow in the bypass over time. That's the angiogram on the left, but that's the angiogram from the MR, and we are measuring flow with the NOVA, and the flow usually stays good over years. So we follow our patients with the NOVA, and we check the flow in the STA over the years. But sometimes what we found is that the flow decreases. So here's a case, a bypass, for carotid dissection, occlusion of the carotid acutely, and the patient was symptomatic. So it's an STA-MCA bypass, and the flow was 79 at three days. But later, the flow got reduced. It went down to 37. So we did the angiogram, and what we found is the carotid reopened and the graft shrunk. So there's a reciprocal, again, relationship between demand and supply driven by the flow uh, by the pressure grade. So we do see that in ischemia, but it's related to, over time, a change in the delta P. The other more common reason of technical problem is the donor. So the donor sometimes is problematic. <laughs> this video. And the donor can have a problem related to uh, what we call 2A. Here you can see, for example, in the harvest, uh, the artery was, was squeezed because of this band from the vein. We talked about that. Here's another example, the 2A problem, where the artery can be sick. You see this artery, it has many layers, and it has a very uh, double wall. Sometimes we see it. It's a double wall, so it's very thick. It does not flow well. So what you have to do, you have to, of course, try to cool more proximally to find a better segment. So here, luckily, we were able to go more proximally and the lumen here was much better. So we're able to use that and then we go ahead. But uh, you can see it's shorter now, it is shorter. So here's the cut flow being measured. And the cut flow in this case was, I think, quite good, it was 70. That's pretty good cut flow. And then we're measuring the recipient to confirm, and the recipient has very little flow, two cc's. And many of you that measure flow know that in Moya Moya, there's almost no flow. And after the bypass, it was a decent index, 30, so more than 50%, and, uh, or close to 50%. So that's, that's, that's a 2A problem. The most common problem is the anastomosis. So that's technical, of course. And what has to happen here is training. We have to practice. There's many models of training. And I think the simpler model is the battle model. This is a uh, turkey wing or chicken wing. This is very good. But we don't need anything sophisticated. This is as I was showing you earlier. This is my microscope at home. And you can practice on anything. You can practice on a piece of paper. You can practice on a flower. You can practice on, on anything. So a technical is important. Now, for Moya Moya, 2C is the real problem. 2C means the recipient. So the recipient can be diseased. And in flow augmentation for Moya Moya, that is, I think, the real problem. And what is 2C? This is a good bypass. You see the cut flow is 152. The bypass flow is 149. 98% fills the MCA, great index. This is a good angiographic bypass. The cut flow is almost 70, but the flow in the bypass is only 18, only 18. And the index is 27%. So if you look at the angiogram, you think this is a good bypass, but the index tells you this is not a very good bypass. So what's the problem? The problem is that when the MCA is occluded at the trunk, 
and extend into the branches, the territories don't communicate. So even though this vessel can give 70 cc's, it has nowhere to go. And it will only go in a little area and it cannot perfuse the whole hemisphere. So this is a type 2C problem, very common in Moya Moya because the territories do not communicate. And this is why over time, I'm gonna go over this evolution of strategies for Moya Moya disease to where eventually we came to this Minimax bypass that we call it Minimax. It's single vessel double anastomosis SVDA or 1V2A, one vessel to anastomosis. We wanna start with how we started. We all know that every study that has been done pretty much confirms that a direct bypass for Moya is in the adult is better than indirect bypass that we want to revascularize as many territories or compartments as needed. So we all know that, we all do that. This is an example of a sickle cell disease that gives the equivalent of Moya Moya. And when we study this patient with the NOVA, you can see the right MCA is 230, the left MCA is very poor at 56. And after we do a diamox, there is a steel. It even decreases. The left MCA goes down to 42. So I mentioned that to you earlier. And we have confirmed, therefore, that this patient needs flow augmentation. So this is a traditional double limb bypass or double branches bypass. And you can see that the trunk of the STA can give 40 cc's, 41 cc's. But when we do the first bypass with the frontal branch, there's 24 cc's. So the index is only 58%. That means we're only using half of what this STA can give. And we, when we add the second branch, we get another 20 cc's. And now we have an index of one. So this is a good idea. The double barrel bypass is a good idea and can correct. And you see here, we're measuring the flow in the, with the NOVA and the STA trunk. And then we measure it at 90, we measure it in one anastomosis and in the other anastomosis. We can do that, and it's a good idea. And a total bypass flow of 95, that's very good. That was ischemic. You can do it in hemorrhagic. You can see the Moya Moya pattern, very low flow, 34 in the left MCA. So we start with that. It's also low on the right, but we start with the left. You see here the Moya pattern. And that's the classic two limb, large craniotomy, double anastomosis, very good angiographic result, revascularizes the territories, very good flow on the NOVA. You can see one branch here, you can see another branch here, good flow in the 40s and 70s, excellent. And similarly, so this is a, a good bypass. Again, the double barrel will give luxurious uh, uh, filling and, and, and remedies the fact that the territories don't communicate you see the flows again, 74 on one side, 84 on the other. You can see that an STA can give a lot of flow. So I don't think it's fair to say that STA is low flow if we don't measure it. And a total of 153 cc's. So that's very good. So what's wrong with that? Well, what is wrong with that is that it's a progressive disease and the bypass, direct bypass is sometimes involute. And we know it's a progressive disease. Professor Suzuki taught us this. There is a stages to the disease, so it can progress over time. And when we started to look at the flows over the bypass, we found that a good number of patients over time, the bypass flow decreases. Uh, and we looked at that over time, and I showed you the data. But if we follow our patients, initially at day one and at one week, we have very good patency, 96, 93% patency. But over time, it drops at one year to 81 patency, more than one year, 74 patency. So long term, a portion of these bypasses involute, even though they were good. So how to deal with that? So here's an example, Moya Moya, severe form. And you can see the STA, two branches, very good. So I was initially planning on doing the classic double barrel bypass, but then I, I'm not going to show you the video, but I connected the frontal branch and the flow on the frontal branch was actually very good. I think I had about 70 cc's. So I wanted to preserve the parietal branch then. So I reconnected it, I had cut it. 
So I re-anastomosed it and I left it as an EDES because if this involutes, at least there is something else to come back to and maybe use it as a selvage. And you can see the flow, here's the anastomosis. It's 122 cc's now through this frontal branch. So I did not need to do two bypasses. It would have been too much. And the EDES is still there, it's patent, it's 19 cc's. So that's a good idea. And then came this man, this is, this is, this is, I don't know if it's a man or woman, but there's a bilateral, bilateral ICA occlusion. You can see that there's a steel on the left, the flow goes down and the right side, there's no reserve. This patient is symptomatic. And the problem, this, oh, this, I know what it was. This was a diabetic patient with diabetic retinopathy and the collateral is coming through the eye, through the ophthalmic. So her retinopathy is getting worse. So it's proximal disease, collateral through the eye, not moya moya, but uh, diabetic, juvenile diabetic. <clears throat> so we needed to increase flow and have it such that the flow coming through the ophthalmic gets reduced consequently. So I wanted to do a higher flow bypass because you can see how much flow is coming through the ophthalmic, through the maxillary artery, 90 cc's, a lot of flow, not good. So that's the classic craniotomy, preserving the middle meningeal, save the, the posterior branch, the parietal branch for an indirect bypass and so forth. <clears throat> and But what I did here is I used the anterior branch and I did two bypasses, a side to side and an end to side double bypass to provide more flow. And the posterior branch was an EDAS and of course preserved the MMA, still fills the ophthalmic, and you can see the side to side, end to side, EDAS, and it's a good flow. It's 167 cc's in this bypass. But the good news, because there's flow coming through the STA now, that the flow through the ophthalmic decreased from 90 to 40. So that's good. That relieved the pressure in the eyeball. And, and I thought that's a good idea. And then I, the other option in this patient. So I did the frontal branch. I was going to do an EDAS, but there was not enough flow. So I kept it as an EDAS and I did a side to side here. So that's the other option. If this is not enough, instead of doing an EDAS, keep it as an EDAS and do a side to side. So it's still a double bypass, but with an EDAS. So that's good too. But then I thought, well, that's still a big craniotomy and that's using a lot of vessels and what happens next time when we need to do some. And this is when this patient came in. Now we're into, I think, 2013. I showed you this Nova before. So this patient has steel on the right side. And if you look at his angiogram, he has a very good frontal branch, big one. The parietal branch is smaller, but they're very separated. So if I want to do a traditional flap, it will be a huge flap. And I thought, what if this frontal branch is enough? So I did that. And I isolated the frontal branch and the cut flow was actually quite good, 117 cc's, very good flow. So, and you see the recipient, very low flow. So the patient needs it. So I did a side to side anastomosis with that same vessel. Measure flow, it's 67 cc's. Remember that artery can give hundred cc's. So then I did with the end of it, an end to side and measure flow in the end to side anastomosis, it's 40 cc's. So 67 here, 40 here, total 110 cc's. And we achieved an index of one. So single vessel, double anastomosis, or one vessel to anastomosis, side to side, end to side. So that was, we pioneered that, and you can see the flow, side to side, end to side, and a total flow of 142 cc's. So with one vessel, we're able to fix the problem of revascularizing and doing more than one territory. And of course, this is something that now I like to use mostly, single vessel, preserve the collaterals, don't disrupt the middle meningeal, side to side, end to side. This is now 2015. At the Moya Moya meeting in Berlin, we showed that for the first time, we published it, we published it uh, again multiple times with operative videos. And this is what I like to do. It doesn't work all the time, but this is what I like to do. Sometimes you can have variations of this. This is a recent case, very recent. 
severe moya moya bilaterally. You can see this little branch here that we could use. So this is at surgery. You can see the side branch. And I checked the cut flow in this side branch. And the cut flow was actually not so bad. The cut flow here is 30 cc's in the site branch. So that's pretty good. We prepare it, perform the anastomosis as you're very familiar with. And the baseline flow in this vessel is very low. And after doing the anastomosis, we're gonna check the flow again. And I'll show it to you here. And it's 35 ml, not a lot of flow, but very good index. So that's good enough. And I was happy with that. And what's interesting here, if you look at the ICG, you see the flow that goes into the brain. And where there is an EDAX, the flow is going back and forth. Why? Again, the delta P is not high there. It's higher towards the brain. So it goes to the brain. And this is very interesting. This is the NOVA. It shows you what's happening. So if you look here, the flow is measured in the STA trunk. So that's the STA trunk. It goes up and it goes into the brain. The anastomosis is right here where my arrow is. And that's the vessel that continues as an EDAS. And you see what happened. This vessel is now bigger and the anastomosis is bigger and the rest of the STA is becoming smaller. There's a lot of flow in this, in this STA trunk, 129. And you see how it's going integrate and it's pulsating always positive. Here's the waveform. And here's the bypass. It curves towards the brain. 97 cc's is going to the brain. Very good pulsatility, very good waveform. And the EDAS, you can see the arrow. It goes forward and backward, a little bit backward, a little bit forward, only six cc's. So a lot of physiology, a lot of things that we can learn. But this is how we evolved. So single vessel double anastomosis is preferred, 1V2A. We call it Minimax. Uh, because it's a progressive disease and because the bypass can involute. So we still want to directly revascularize as many territories as possible. We wanna optimize for the donor flow and try to get an index close to one as possible. We wanna use as few vessels as possible, minimize the trauma and avoid disrupting collaterals. And we really don't need a lot of flow. We do not need more than 80 cc's. So the point is not to get 100, 200 cc's, but to use everything this vessel can give us. So again, same thing now, smaller incision, single vessel, side to side, and end to side, preserve the collateral, and uh, all the things that you're familiar with. No disruption of the vein, no use of retractor. So it's a great surgery. We like to do it. There's a lot of art to it. You can look at these pictures. They're very pretty. Uh, if it didn't exist, we probably would be inventing another surgery that uh, is as exciting as this one. But I think we like doing it for a lot of reasons. But the important reason, of course, is we have to do it to achieve a goal. Uh, because the microsurgical skills are important, but the thought process and the physiology is, is also very important. So thank you very much. Congratulations on, on putting this seminar together. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much, Professor Chabel. Uh, in, it's a very compre comprehensive lecture about the STMC bypass, especially about the uh, Moya Moya disease. And I also thank for the uh, great talk about the history of the University of Illinois, starting from the Professor Oldberg period. So thanks so much. So I completely agree that the uh, ultrasound flow meter and the Nova MRI is particularly very variable for the uh, successful STMCA bypass. And uh, also agree with the opinion that the pressure gradient, uh, I mean the accurate diagnosis of the hemodynamic compromise is very important for the successful bypass. Uh, I have one question about the preoperative uh, diagnosis of the hemodynamic compromise. So uh, you, you believe that the uh, NOVA MRI, MRI is the best way to uh, measure the uh, preoperative hemodynamic because we don't have NOVA in my institution and I use the single photon emission CT in Japan, but the MRI could be the best choice. Uh, NOVA, for Moya Moya, NOVA alone is not, is not enough. Uh, Moya Moya is the best in, in more proximal occlusion. 
carotid occlusion and things like that. So we use NOVA and we use regional blood flow at the same time. So I think a uh, uh, single photon is good. Uh, and I think what we like is to have a combination of vessel flow and tissue flow. So I think the combination is good and we like to have all three agree. And I know, of course, in, in Hokkaido and in Sendai, you're very familiar with this. Uh, thanks, Alan. So, uh, Dr. Shubin, do you have any question or comment? Yeah. Uh, actually, I learned a lot from uh, Professor Fadi Shaber. Uh, he is a physical scientist in neurosurgeons. And uh, he created this uh, Shaber uh, probe and the, the NOVA system. Uh, it's really uh, very helpful uh, in learning the, the blood flow cha uh, changes uh, after the bypass. And then uh, it's very helpful in helping us to understand the blood flow, the hemodynamic changes before and after the uh, bypass. Actually, the, uh, we learned that uh, uh, after the bypass from uh, intraoperatively normally uh, because the uh, limitation of the uh, size of the recipient artery, actually the blood flow is uh, quite small in a very uh, limited size recipient artery because of the moya moya normally uh, the vessel is only uh, 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 uh, millimeter. So normally the uh, blood flow is only, uh, no matter how high the uh, donor artery, actually the, uh, the recipient artery uh, decides the uh, quantity of the volume because of the limited size. But actually after the uh, surgery, normally in one week, it can be increased a lot because of the change of the uh, recipient network of the uh, moya moya disease, uh, disease patients. And uh, actually now, uh, I only do the single bypass because normally uh, the double bypass have, have more uh, frequently the uh, hyperperfusion uh, syndromes. So uh, especially the double bypass, uh, normally after one week, uh, the blood volume can uh, more than 130 uh, milliliter per minute. Uh, it's kind of too much for the Moya Moya patients because they already get used to the low perfusion uh, conditions. So now I only use a single bypass. Uh, I performed the double bypass actually for uh, at least four years. Almost every patient, if, the, uh, if they have the uh, adequate, uh, good quality recipient artery, I always do the double bypass, even triple bypass. But uh, I only do the triple bypass in four patients, uh, two male, two female. And uh, in the male patient, uh, after the tri triple bypass, after one week, uh, this is a hemorrhagical Moya Moya patient, patient. And uh, after one week, uh, the uh, patient got uh, re-hemorrhage. Re so I think it's because of the blood flow is too high. So sometimes I'm worried about the uh, blood flow is too high. Thank you, Professor <laughs> Probably the my, yeah. hyperperfusion is more frequent in Asian, among Asian patients, I think. Yeah. There's some yeah. difference between the Asian patient and the, yeah. Okay. Now I will, will um, uh, estimate the recipient network of the MCA. If the ne MCA network is quite good, uh, the, uh, this kind of patient can bear the double bypass. But if the MCA network is very poor, only uh, one bypass is enough. So thank you uh, for uh, for the uh, very 
informative uh, presentation. And uh, I also uh, agree with uh, Fadi Shaber's uh, quantitative uh, bypass. I, th I think this is a very, uh, actually, I think the future, uh, in the future, maybe the uh, best solution for this uh, personal treatment, uh, individualized uh, bypass, maybe we can uh, pre-calculate the, the donor artery, recipient artery net network, uh, every parameters we can calculate and uh, we can know uh, how, how much the blood volume would be uh, after the uh, after seven days after the surgery, yeah. Normally, it's it can be uh, reached to the peak after the bypass surgery in one week. Well, if I may comment, uh, Professor Shabin, you are uh, uh, ever thoughtful and gracious. Uh, you are very kind and and. Uh, 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 I appreciate what you said, and I've also learned tremendously from you. I've, uh, <laughs> as you know, and I've, I've gone there, I've visited, I love visiting there. Of course, I visited Hokkaido, and, and I've, I've visited Professor Shubin. I watched him do his clean, efficient surgery. Uh, amazing. <clears throat> All of you know, he's a, he's a, he's a master surgeon, and he speaks from enormous experience. Uh, so... Uh, uh, we, everybody should go visit, and uh, hopefully the time will come where we can go and visit again. But I like your comment very much. I think what you're saying, are you? I think you're thinking more than what you're saying, and I think I'm reading because I know you. Your mind is a few steps ahead. The idea of uh, of being able to maybe use some advanced uh, calculations uh, with the data to see if we can predictively. Uh, I like this, and uh, maybe we can continue to uh, to discuss that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, now I'm uh, studying the uh, Bernoulli's square. Yeah, it's uh, uh, also very helpful in uh, calculating the uh, hemodyna hemodynamic changes. Yeah, about the energy loss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Amazing. Amazing. So finally, finally, one more question from the audience. I would I, I, I introduced the question from the Dr. Hashad. Uh, his question is about the indication for the multiple bar hole surgery. I mean the, probably the indirect bypass, indication for the indirect bypass. So Professor Shada, could you sure I think this is an option. Uh, in uh, certainly in, in very, very young children, one could do that, it would work. Uh, it's an option of last resort, perhaps in the adult. Um, I, I must say that uh, I have not seen it successful uh, because I have very little uh, pediatric practice. So in my hand, I've seen it very, very infrequently to be of use. Sometimes we see a little collateral around the burr hole that form, I think it's possible, but I don't think it's enough. But I would like to ask uh, you, Professor Fujimura, Professor Shubin, I agree with you. our colleagues. Yeah, for the adult patient, I believe that the direct bypass is strongly recommended for adult patients. So I agree with So Now, probably the time, almost the time, Dr. Raja. Right, thank you so much. Professor Sharbel, what a oh, lecture it was. Yeah, really. I would like to thank Professor Sharbel for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We learned Pleasure. a lot from you today. Thank you, Sharbel. Technology thank into you. Thank you, surgery. It was a really very wonderful lecture. Maybe kindly go to our second lecture. For that, I would like to invite the chair, Professor Hidanuri Endo, to say a few words, and then he would invite the speaker, Professor Yabu Huan. It's my great honor to have an opportunity. It's my great honor to have an opportunity to manage this seminar. Really appreciate Great. Dr. Yoko Kato to invite me to this webinar. We have a speaker from China, Professor Yabu Huang, who is a consultant neurosurgeon of the first affiliated hospital of Shuzhou University. Today's topic is surgical strategy in unclippable MC aneurysms. It is very nice to meet you, uh, Dr. Huang. I've been looking forward to seeing you on this webinar. Annual surgery is one of my work life, so I will enjoy your talk tonight. Can you start your lecture? Uh, 
Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting from Professor Xin and Professor Cato. It is a good it is a great honor to attend this online academic academic conference. Uh, I am a vascular neurosurgeon. I come from the Department of the Neurosurgery, the first affiliated hospital of the Suzhou University in China. Uh, today, my topic is uh, microsurgical treatment strategy for the unclippables MCs aneurysm. Okay. Uh, most common side of the circular aneurysm. Each aneurysm arises from the branch side of the large artery. A large artery. Uh, most are located on or near the circle of the veins. As we will know that, single aneurysm are treated endovascular with the standalone calling, a loose assessed calling, a standard assessed calling. Flow diet nodes dominate the treatment of carbonous and uh, prognoid uh, ICS aneurysm. Intraaneurysm flow diveters have been developed for the bifurcation aneurysm. Uh, what is complex uh, aneurysm? Uh, defined as, as those with a wide necks, large size, Delicatetic morphology, intraluminal thrombosis, prev previous endovascular therapy, or the anthroscalar rotic walls. Um, these portions of the aneurysm market demand even more from vascular neurosurgery, uh, incre increasing the need for the bypass. Uh, so I think so. Um, complex unclippable uh, MCS aneurysms. Uh, this aneurysm has it is clinical characteristics. Uh, aneurysms of the proximal M1 segment in which there are lenticular street perforated aris arising from the aneurysm or the few the forms future M1. M2 bifurcation aneurysms are wide necks involving the perforations artery. The distal M2 or M3 segment are the fusiform and the thrombotic. This aneurysm are technique uh, difficult to manage and a subset of which need to be managed with bypass technique as part of a treatment strategy with a deliberate uh, occlusion of a uh, parent artery. Also, uh, the feasibility of clipping uh, uh, aneurysm can often be determined from the preoperative angiography. Intraoperative the inspection remains to be the best method. Only during the operations can be decision be made whether the aneurysm can be clipped or not. Uh, let's take two examples to illustrate this uh, my point. Uh, this one, this is a ruptured aneurysm, and the patient was admitted with the subacnoid hemorrhage. Uh, this is a uh, 48 years old women present with a headache. This is a ruptured aneurysm. DSS should adjunct aneurysm originating from the right M1 to M2 bifurcation segment, diameter uh, 35 millimeter, and find that uh, acres aneurysm. This is uh, on ruptured aneurysm because the relationship between the branch wash and aneurysms could not be clearly distinguished uh, preoperatively. So I think simple clip is uh, impossible and uh, I propel for the bypass. 
uh, let me see this uh, video. Uh, the survival future is fully opened during the no tractor or less tractor. This sector and uh, expose of the M1, M2, and uh, aneurysm. First, uh, I temporarily clip the M1 and uh, M2 uh, puncture and aspiration of aneurysm, and then accessions part of aneurysm's body, uh, and then perform the clip reconstruction technique. Um, at last, uh, I used uh, 11 clips. Tandem clipping with the Stank Street clippers was applied to reco reconstruct uh, the bifurcation. The aneurysm was clipped uh, completely and the aneurysm neck was uh, remodeled. Uh, ICG's radio angiography shows that the annu aneurysm disappeared. And uh, we can see the M1, uh, the superior and imperial M2 strand is patterned, uh, clips echoes uh, aneurysm. This is uh, post operative DCS suicide aneurysm dispel and war branch artery is patterned. The patient, the patient was fear of any neurologist deficient. Uh, let me see is, uh, case two. Uh, this is on ruptured aneurysm and the patient was admitted with dizziness, dizziness. Before operation, we saw that there are the lenticular street uh, perforate uh, arising from the aneurysm. And I think I considered the uh, preparation for the bypass therapy. However, during the operation, we were surprised to find that the aneurysm did not involve the uh, perforation artery. Mm, let me see the video. Uh, dissect and uh, expose M1, M2, and aneurysm. I find uh, lenticular street perforate arising from M1 segment located in front of the aneurysm. The aneurysm did not involve the uh, perforations arteries. Uh, so I perform the clip reconstruction technique. Um, Multiple clipping with the parallel uh, stack clips was uh, uh, played to reconstruct the M1 statement. The aneurysm was uh, clipped uh, uh, completely, and the aneurysm's neck was reconstructed. Interoperative the ICG's video angiography shows that the aneurysm disappeared and the war branch artery is patent. This is uh, post-operation MRA shows that aneurysm disappear and war branch artery is patent. Uh, this is our express uh, clinical caricatures of the setting patient with a complex uh, MCA aneurysm treated by the cerebral revascularization. Um, so I know few aneurysms in the MCA are considered uh, to be unclippable, but the uh, endovascular and uh, microcytical clipper reconstruction techniques may be impossible on certain situations, such as giant or fuse the form aneurysm in which the parent artery or a giant artery's branch uh, may be incorporated into the aneurysm base, calcifications, or anthroscalar rotical thickening. Uh, this making clippers dangerous. So 
we perform the serial blood revascularization. Uh, this is bypass technique. Uh, include uh, seven uh, kinds of uh, technique. Uh, ECIC bypass, ECIC interposition bypass, re-implantation, re, re anastomosis in the situ uh, bypass, ICIC interposition nails bypass, combination, com combinations bypass. We can uh, uh, kiss three. Uh, this this is uh, the forty years old women, president with headache. Um, this is a ruptured aneurysm. CTA suicides a giant fused form aneurysm origination from the right M3 segment. Diameter is uh, twenty six millimeter. Uh, this is suicide. The aneurysm had one effort uh, effort. Uh, Effort uh, artery, proximax uh, M3, and the two effort uh, arteries, the distal M3, and uh, a small perforation arteries arising from the aneurysm dome, which was confirmed in the operation. Uh, let me see this value. Uh, the aneurysm was exposed by the right theory on the approach. We can see the aneurysm M2, distal M3, and uh, a small, and a small, and I found a uh, small perforating arteries arising from the aneurysm. Since aneurysm accession was uh, impossible, we saw the sacrifice uh, the small perforating arteries arising from the aneurysm. Intraoperative ICG video angiography was used to determine whether there was a lateral circulation to provide adequate blood flow supplying for the perforated artery. Fortunately, ICG's uh, uh, side simulates feeling of the distal M3 and the perforating artery. The pro proximal and distal M3 such men were temporarily occluded, then performed STA to M3 end to end anastomosis of, after bypass, uh, the aneurysm was resected. Remove the aneurysm. Uh, SEG's radio angiography shows feeling of uh, distal M3 and the perforation artery, uh, and I can uh, uh, graft is patency. Uh, this is the post operation MRI. Shows that there is no ischemia in the temporary lobe. The post operative DSS shows that a patency bypass and a complete occlusion of the aneurysm. Let me see case four. A 14 year old boy presented with unconsciousness suddenly. This is a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, the CTA should uh, fuse form aneurysm originating from the left M2 segment. Uh, physical examination is hand hands second grid. Uh, the patient have a uh, old cerebral in function in the left temporal temporary label. Uh, this this is a picture. It shows that uh, we have the two microsurgical treatment stitches. Uh, the first way, at first, I performed a STA, a STA uh, M2 and two side anastomosis, and then performed the aneurysm accession. This is simple technical. But I, but I, but I selected the signal wave. 
after performing the ICIC bypass and then performed any rhythm extension. We can see this is uh, M1, this is uh, the superior M2, this is the inferior M2. Uh, after a temporary clip M1 and M2 trunk, first the inferior M2 trunk was or cut off from the aneurysm and then performed the inferior uh, M2 trunk to the superior M2 trunk and to side anastomosis and then performed the aneurysm extension. Uh, at last, I select the ICIC bypass. Uh, this is the post operation. Uh, CT shows that there isn't a new ischemia in the temporary lobe. Uh, post operative, the CTA should a uh, patent says uh, ICIC bypass and complete the occlusion of the aneurysm. The patient was uh, feel of the any neurologic deficient. Uh, the patient is good. Let me see this uh, case file. This is a uh, uh, 48 years old uh, woman, uh, present with a sudden headache. Uh, CT scan shows that uh, subacnoid hemorrhage in the right seven fusion, uh, ruptured uh, aneurysm. DSS shows that the giant fuse, fuse form aneurysm originating from the M1's bifurcation. Um, this is the picture. Is we can see the inferior trunk. Inferior trunk arose from the aneurysm. Aneurysm making the direct clippings impossible. But I can see the superior M2 trunk origin originated from the base of the aneurysm, but. Uh, but was not involved in the neck of the aneurysm. I want to reconstruct the MCA bifurcation and preserve the, the superior trunk. I want to complete the obligation, uh, obliterated the aneurysm between the M1 Sediment and inferior trunk, inferior trunk. Uh, so I perform uh, the STA to M2 bypass was performed to supply the anterior, anterior grid flow to the inferior trunk. Let me see this video. Um, Mm. The patient was operated on the by the transsevals approach. After any reason, this is open the the severe future. Mm. After the aneurysm was exposed, intraoperative finding demonstrated that the inferior M2 strand arose from the aneurysm. The, super, the superior M2 strand originated from the base of the aneurysm, but, not, uh, but was not involved in the neck of the nature. This finding was further for confirmed by the intraoperative the uh, ICG's video uh, angiography. Uh, let me see. Uh, this is the superior M2 strand. This is the inferior, uh, inferior uh, M2 strand. Uh, this actually is good. So 
I decided to uh, perform the STA and to end to side anesthesis in the in the inferior tract. I like to interrupt the suture. After M2 uh, STA and to side anastomosis and perform the temporary clip and uh, and then the aneurysm was opened. Temporary the superior superior uh, M two trunk and uh, puncture and aspiration. Uh, And the aneurysm, aneurysm's neck was completely translated to simplify the clipping. And the intraluminal thrombus was removed. Uh, Hyperin sealing the irrigation vessels uh, luma. And uh, then uh, I performed the tandem clipping with uh, stacked uh, stride fenestrated clippers was applied to recon reconstruct the MC by formation, bifurcation, and uh, preserve the su superior track. I select a, a stride clip was used to completely obliterate, obliterate the aneurysm uh, between the M1 segment and the inferior trunk, inferior trunk. Obliterate the aneurysm between the M1 segment and the inferior trunk. And uh, Open the artery. And uh, ICG's radio angiography shows that STA. M2 bypass supplied anterior grid flow to the inferior M2 trunk. Uh, aneurysm dispel and uh, and the superior M2 trunk is patency. The patient was conscious as discharge without any neurological impairment. Post operative DSS should be the complete occlusion of the aneurysm. A reconstructive or super superior M2 trunk and the patency of the STA M2 bypass is patency. Uh, let me see the kiss sex. Uh, this is a uh, 27 years old man suffering from numberness of the left limb for one month. And he was received microsurgical clipping of the right MC aneurysm uh, eight years ago. 
a city a schedule that a giant lesion in the right front temporal label. Uh, a DSA's uh, should side a giant recurrent uh, thrombotic aneurysm ranging from, from the right segment. Uh, because because aneurysm involve, involves the branches and uh, perforating artery, direct clipping or the endovascular treatment was impossible. The aneurysm was treated uh, with the proximal occlusion and the right ECA to radial artery to the M2 bypass. This is high flow bypass was performed to supply the richer grade uh, uh, flow to the unbypassed M2 and uh, lenticular street uh, arteries. The post, this is uh, a post-operative disease confirmed the patency, patency of, the, of the bypass graft. The post, uh, this is the post-operative disease should style the complaint, the obliteration of the aneurysm and the MCA territory was supplied from ACA once the bypass. Um, case seven and uh, case eight uh, was unpredicted the right M1 giant multiple aneurysm uh, because aneurysm involved uh, branches and uh, perforating arteries, uh, direct, uh, I think, direct clipping or the endovascular treatment was impossible. Uh, the aneurysm was treated with uh, proximal uh, occlusion, proximal occlusion, and uh, a right ECA to the radial artery to the M2 bypass. Um, we can see the graft is a patency. Uh, this logic behind this strategy is simple. Uh, reducing flow to the aneurysm promotes thrombosis. Where the bypass railway cholesterolization, the territory beyond the aneurysm. Summarize the uh, treatment strategy should depend on the aneurysm clinic clusters and aneurysm characteristics such as aneurysm size, location, morphology, and so on. When MCA aneurysm involved the incorporated branch walls perforating the artery, the aneurysm was treated with uh, bypass flowed by the proximal occlusion of the perio parent, parent uh, vessels feeding the aneurysm, or bypass followed by the clipping reconstruction. When MC aneurysm did not uh, involve the incorporated branches, was perforating artery bypass combined with the aneurysm the trapping and the bypass with the aneurysm extension was used. So I, I think that the treatment stage for this unclippable giant aneurysm is uh, reasonable. Uh, our expresses with the use of the ECS bypass in the treatment of the giant MC aneurysm is limited, place criticized and correct. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang. I was very impressed by your treatment. Every cases were very successfully treated by the multiple clipping. Or, uh, sorry, my, my video is on. Yeah. And then my question is, uh, what is the best timing to decide to perform bypass surgery for the complex aneurysms? Do you decide uh, before surgery or during surgery? I mean, preparation of yeah, the- uh, yeah, 
打开你的话筒。I think uh, uh, after after uh, pre operations uh, examination and uh, I think uh, I uh, think uh, uh, the MC aneurysm uh, is not involved the uh, branch artery. Uh, I so I can select uh, uh, treatment. Sometimes during craniotomy, you know, the ST graft was sometimes sacrificed during craniotomy. So I think it's uh, sometimes important to decide to perform bypass surgery bef before surgery. I mean, to uh, to preserve the ST graft. My second question is the perforated occlusion after surgery. I mean, delayed delayed occlusion of the perforator even after bypass surgery. And do you do you have any comment to the uh, perforator delayed occlusion of the perforators, which is very uh, associated with the poor clinical outcomes of the patients? May, may I? Yeah. Uh, I cannot do this. <laughs> I first uh, I uh, select uh, at first uh, I perform the I pass treat uh, this uh, any them. I cannot uh, do a uh, later clipper. I do not uh, do this uh, do this way. Uh, no no no. You know maybe I can answer your question. Yes, your question okay. is very important because uh, the delayed. Uh, occlusion of the, uh, by, uh, the, the perforators is very important complications in the very complex giant uh, MCA aneurysm. Actually, even you do the distal bypass combined the distal occlusion, sometimes it, it's uh, still happened because of the uh, blood flow uh, stagnation uh, in the uh, giant dome of the aneurysm and the, if the Blood flow was uh, slow enough, it can be formed the thrombos. So this is a, sometimes I think it's um, unavoidable. Yeah. So I think the trapping, complete occlusion of the aneurysm, I mean, trapping of the aneurysm is, is very risky uh, to have a delayed occlusion yes. perforated. So yes. I think it's important to preserve one of the branch, I mean, one of the M2 branches and the anti-grade flow of the M M1 to M2 is very important to preserve the uh, LSA perforators. Yes, actually, uh, if you comment on yeah, both the fourth case or the fifth case, uh, I would like the fifth case, the treatment of the fifth case. Mm -hmm. I would prefer it, that treatment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you, you 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 preserve the one one trunk. Yeah, yeah, and the, yeah, yeah. I agree with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor Fadi Shabar, are you there? Sharbel, are you here? I am, and I am <laughs> listening to your uh, to your comment, and I fully agree. Both of you, Professor Endo and Professor Shubin, I think our uh, speaker gave an excellent talk, and he probably did not get the question, uh, but I think that you're right. The uh, you know, this is the big, big frustration of bypass for aneurysm, really. Uh, the, the bypass is one part of it, and then so much can happen afterwards that's almost unpredictable. Yeah. And uh, so we have to be prepared. So your point, uh, Professor Endo, is absolutely 100% correct. We have to, the best way is to preserve flow along the natural direction of flow. Like Hunter said, where where it is needed, we have to we have to enhance it in its normal direction. So the the, the stagnation in perforators, uh, I know we all know what you mean. I mean we can remember those patients where we can sometimes yeah. we see the perforators thrombosing yeah. in front of our eyes at yeah. surgery. Yeah, big problem. Uh, Professor Sh uh, Chabert. You mentioned the, the blood flow augmentation bypass and the blood flow replacement uh, uh, bypass. 
I think there's uh, the third type, uh, which I would call it follow flow from the navel uh, artery, which is an ICIC bypass, side to side. Actually, it's uh, uh, actually it's a steer flow from the original navel artery. I think uh, 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 because you know uh, some. Uh, neurosurgeon recommended this uh, ICIC bypass a lot, but actually I don't think it's a very reasonable because you 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 have to occlude temporal occlude the both artery, yeah, and then uh, when when you do the side to side bypass and uh, if you do the uh, blood flow replacement, like I only need to occlude one branch and the steer keeps the patency of the. Uh, Another branch and uh, do the replacement bypass is, uh, uh, I would prefer that treatment. I agree. Yeah. And I actually, agree. you didn't increase the original blood flow from the ICA, just follow some blood flow from the navel artery. Yeah. So, this is uh, the third type, I think. Yeah, I think that uh, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of uh, uh, I mean, we all like to do different things, but uh, but when you take, if you want to do a side to side on the M2, you are occluding both M2s at the same time. Yeah, uh, I think it is better to uh, to do more work and to do uh, STMCA before, or yeah, uh, and 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 the risk that you also mentioned is that what if something goes wrong? Yeah. Then you lose everything. Yes. So, in in the same way, uh, brain, I would like to ask our honorable chairs and speakers that uh, delayed perforator occlusion is one of the complications. And recently, there have been a few case studies which have propped up in the literature. Recently, the most recent being from in neurosurgery about low dose heparin infusion after aneurysm. Clipping. So, what what is your opinion? How would it help with regard to delayed perforator occlusion? Professor Sharbel, would you like to take this? Uh, I can try and answer it, and I think the answer may be different where you are located. Uh, <clears throat> I think the biology of patients is different between the Caucasian population, uh, the African American population that has sickle cell disease that we bypass sometimes. They're very hypercoagulable. And I think the Asian population, as far as uh, response to either high dose aspirin or anticoagulation. So I think the answer should be uh, based on our experience. Uh, I do use uh, anticoagulation anytime. Uh, uh, first of all, I use aspirin routinely, uh, but uh, the experience is not the same. I think the comments will be different, uh, maybe in Japan or in China. And I use anticoagulation with heparin anytime I temporarily occlude a vessel larger than two millimeters. Uh, so I heparinize. Uh, of course, there is risk related to that. Uh, as far as low dose heparin uh, after surgery, um, if we try it uh, and we use it, uh, I think there's already a problem that's going on. Honestly, I don't think it really saved us. Uh, so it's hard to know if it worked, if it really was the heparin that helped. And uh, so I, I, there's, no, there's no way scientifically to answer that question. But I think it's more important to acknowledge that different patient population and different experiences, we have to be careful not to generalize. Thank you very much. Dr. Shubin, what is your experience? Yes, you know, I performed uh, eight case uh, for the joint. Uh, M1 to M1, uh, M2 segment uh, aneurysm with a distal bypass combined a distal uh, occlusion. Uh, I think this is a, 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 actually the first four cases are all okay. So I think this is a maybe best strategy in keeps the patency of the uh, small perforators. But uh, in the nine case, still have, uh, have two cases it happened the delayed uh, occlusion of the 
uh, small perforators. Actually, it's uh, normally this uh, perforators is uh, uh, located the uh, feed the basal ganglion. So it can even a small infarction can, it can be cause uh, hyperparalysis. So this is a very uh, very uh, important complication after the after this uh, treatment. And actually, uh, in the intraoperative way, we use uh, MEP, SCP monitoring, everything looks okay. But uh, <clears throat> normally, it happened just like Indo mentioned, it's a delayed uh, infarction. So uh, sometimes it happens uh, in after 24 hours. So even we use, uh, just like uh, Fadi Shabar mentioned, uh, use a, a small dose of heparin, uh, uh, aspirin, everything, but it still happens. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another qu question to Professor Yabo Huang is, the aneurysm dome remodeling with the help of bipolar forceps is a popular technique in Japan. Have you tried it in large MC aneurysms? You mean maybe, maybe this, <laughs> this question is, a asking about the Japan, popular in Japan? In general, in Japan, this is a very popular technique, of course. But how is it in your place? Uh, normally, we don't coagulate the base of uh, the aneurysm dome. But uh, we uh, do notice uh, the, uh, some coagulation in the videos of uh, like uh, uh, Professor Yasagios and uh, Professor uh, Professor Yuha Hernandez videos, they they like to coagulate the vessel, uh, the aneurysm dome, but normally we don't coagulate. Yeah. It, it How about uh, Professor Chabert? What's your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you uh, that uh, I I have seen. I, I think it is useful a little bit. To, yeah. to, to help maybe if the aneurysm is very large and you cannot see, can coagulate a little bit to start to see behind it, but not to rely on it. Yeah. Uh, and I agree with you, but I'm curious about our, our, our colleagues from Japan. Actually, I like coagulating aneurysm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. But, you know, the uh, benefit of a coagulation is to, you know, uh, arrange the uh, shape of the aneurysms and uh, make it make the decision for the you know clip angle so i think it's very useful to sometimes sometimes useful to coagulate aneurysms but the you know thinner wall it's very risky especially for the ruptured case so i usually do the unruptured uh, aneurysms. Sometimes okay. useful under the sufficient proximal control, of course, for the unruptured large giant aneurysm, uh, for the better closure line of the aneurysm before clipping or something. Sometimes useful, but uh, not for the ruptured aneurysm, no. of course. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. So I think uh, we'll take one comment from my co-host Liu Bun Seng before we wrap this up. Thank you, Raja. I have a question for Prof. Chabal. Uh, regarding uh, uh, cut flow, how do you get the cut flow for side-to-side uh, -side anastomosis? Because you show us uh, N, N, N pressure, but how about side-to-side, -side, how you determine the flow? If, if the vessel is still in continuity, so uh, you mean side-to-side -side for a IC, IC yes. bypass or EC, IC? Uh, for example, like A3, A3 bypass, how you determine the donor? Let's say the right side is a donor to the left. How you determine the cut flow from the donor? Yeah. So the cut flow is only for a vessel where you uh, uh, say like an STA or an occipital artery. If you are doing an IC-IC bypass, what I do is I measure the flow at the baseline in each vessel. And then after the anastomosis, measure the flow again and see if the flow is, is, uh, is sufficient or not. So it would not be cut flow, it's just be simple flow measurement. Your second question, unfortunately, we could hear yeah. on and off. My, my second question uh, regarding the cut flow uh, index can it be affected by the flow direction of the recipient artery? Yes, uh, that's a very good question also. And the answer is at least theoretically, yes. There has been a lot of work 
done at looking at the integrate retrograde flow and i think you know that the uh, the work at uh, stein uh, stanford gary steinberg did a lot of flow measurements uh with the flow probe and they looked at the outcome so whether the flow is going retrograde or it's going integrate and the angle makes a difference unfortunately this is theoretical because in practice it is often hard to really position uh, the graft properly so in theory uh, it looks good but uh, practically we do the best we can but your answer your question is a good one yes right. i agree with you because according to the Swiss square actually the when the blood flow from the donor artery uh, inflow to the recipient artery normally is by direction just uh, maybe different pr proportion yeah, Shubin, yeah. you have a very good, uh, I remember you showing a very good analysis of this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think we'll go back to our chair, Professor Hidan Oriando, to get his concluding remarks. Thank you very much, everybody. It's very good discussion about the uh, uh, bypass surgery and the complex uh, aneurysm cases. Thank you very much for your cooperation and many uh, educational comments from all over the world. It was my great pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Professor Shabir. Yeah, Professor Yeah, today yeah, we everyone. almost have 2,000 audience. Uh, Friday Shabir is very famous in China. <laughs> and Ya Bo Huang is also very famous. <laughs> right. Thank you. So I thank you. Up mm. officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Sri Kaito, I'd like to sincerely thank both the speakers for today, Professor Friday Shabir and Professor Ya Bo Huang, oh. as well as the chairs, Professor Hidden Oriendo and Professor Miki Fujimura for taking up their time in support for the ACNS and its educational activities. So thank you everybody, a special thanks to Professor Shubin for, and we are extremely grateful to him for arranging Professor Yabo Huang and also broadcasting links on WeChat channel as well. So until we all meet on 12th, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you everybody who joined.